Hi, everybody. My name is Alexandra. I'm one of the emerging technologies librarians here at the Hudson Library and Historical Society. And I'm so excited to welcome you all tonight uh, for our program with the international best-selling author, Angie Kim. Before we get started, I just want to give you guys a quick note that our virtual author series is continuing um, on Tuesday, August 18th at 7 p.m. with Eric J. Dolan, who's the author of A Furious Sky, The 500-Year History of America's Hurricanes. Uh, Dolan's going to talk about the history of American hurricanes from nameless storms that threatened Columbus's voyage to the devastation wrought by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the um, escalation of the hurricane season due to global warming. So that should be a super interesting program and you can register. Um, there's going to be a link in the chat and you can also go to HudsonLibrary.org to register and check out all of our exciting virtual programs we have like this evening. Um, okay. Another quick note for everybody this evening, um, we're open to questions. So if you'd like to leave any questions, whether you're on Facebook live right now, or if you're here on Zoom, if you want to leave any questions in the chat, we will be taking questions this evening. Um, also, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, um, we are partnering with the Learned Owl Bookshop in Hudson. And Angie will be signing book plates for those who purchase a book from the Learned Owl. Alrighty. So on to tonight's program. I am so excited to welcome Angie Kim. Angie Kim is an international best-selling author and Edgar winner and her debut um, novel is Miracle Creek, which was named Best Book of the Year by Time, The Washington Post, Kirkus, and The Today Show. A Korean immigrant and former editor of the Harvard Law Review and one of Variety Magazine's inaugural 10 storytellers to watch. She has written for Vogue, the New York Times Book Review, Washington Post, Glamour, and numerous lit literary journals. Um, she also was one of our books for our Mystery Book Club earlier this year, and she currently lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and sons. Please everyone join me in welcoming Angie Kim. Hi, Hi everyone. I'm, I, I just realized that all of my messages that I've been doing on, on chat have only gone to the panelists. So I'm saying hello, everyone, to everyone, and um, also letting you know, I actually just signed the book plates and mailed them off. I went to the post office today mm -hmm. in my town, like for the first time since March or whatever, and it was so strange to actually be there. So anyway, so the book plates are off, and the learned owls should have the book plates, and so anyway, so fun. Um, how are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> How are you doing during okay. this? I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm doing a lot of these Zoom events and I'm <laughs> trying to have a different varietal of wine with every single one. So tonight is a rosé, with a, which is a Cabernet Franc rosé. So yay, there. <laughs> that sounds lovely. <laughs> So to talk about your book, um, Miracle Creek, yeah. so much to unpack. I was wondering if you could start off this evening by giving a brief synopsis for those of us who haven't yet read this book. Sure, yes. Um, so Miracle Creek is my debut novel. Um, it is by, it is definitely the first book I've even tried to write. Not, you know, not even just like the first one that I've actually managed to get published, which I know is the case for a lot of writers. Um, and I think that we put a lot of ourselves into our novels, and it's definitely the case for me here. So I'm a Korean immigrant. I'm a former trial lawyer, and I am the mom of three boys here in Northern Virginia. And so it probably won't surprise you that much to say that, you know, this is um, this, with this being my first novel, Miracle Creek is a literary courtroom drama, so it has those courtroom scenes that I'm familiar with, and it is about an immigrant family from Korea, just like my own, um, who owns a, a hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT business called Miracle Submarine, which is in a fictional town in rural Virginia, not too far from where I live. I'm mean, sort of in the like outskirts of DC on sort of where um, 
in the horse country where you might call it suburbia and you might call it more of the, you know, the rural parts. Um, in any case, it's about a young single mother who's on trial for murdering an eight-year-old boy who has autism. And um, what happens is in the beginning of the novel, there's an explosion at a business called the Miracle Submarine, which is a hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, chamber that holds a whole bunch of like four different patients who are inside who are um, kids with autism and cerebral palsy. And it's a business that's run by a Korean immigrant family. And there's an explosion with the pure oxygen that's been fed into this, this sealed chamber, medical chamber. And so some people die and there are injuries, very serious ones. And then we immediately fast forward a year into a four day murder trial. And um, we follow the murder trial and we follow the perspectives of seven different people as they recount not only their experience throughout the four day murder trial, but also sort of go back and take us back through their memories in a very close person narrative, third person narrative, and tell us about what happened really that fateful night um, in which the fire occurred and all of this drama occurred. And so we tried to figure out, we as the readers um, follow along with the jury and it is sort of a whodunit in, a sense, in one sense, a whodunit as well as a why done it and a how done it into what happened that night to cause this fire to happen. Um, but I'm also hoping that it's a little bit more than just the whodunit in the sense that I sort of thought of this as almost like a Trojan horse, that the why done it, the mystery part, the murder mystery was almost sort of a way to get to hook the readers in and as they were actually reading about the events that occurred, that we would get a deep dive, if you will, into the lives of these people, both the um, Korean immigrants who are really isolated in this rural town and feeling like they don't belong, as well as the parents of these kids who are suffering from disabilities and medical issues and who also feel so isolated and are really looking for a way to connect with the broader community. And so it's really about parenting sacrifices and about the way that we are seeking for that connection with each other. That sounds awesome. Um... So one of the things, at least I'll say, when we discussed this book earlier this year, we had a lot of questions on the HBOT therapy. And I was wondering if you could go yes. well, um, We spent a good portion of that <laughs> discussion trying to look up stuff because we were very curious about it. I wonder if you had any insights or experience with it or what led you to write about it. Absolutely. So yeah, that's is sort of the, the foundation of the novel for me. And um, like I said, I do have sort of my other earlier strands for my life in the fact that I was a preteen immigrant from Korea, which is um, sort of dovetails with one of the characters in the novel and her experience. And I also did, you know, this trial law type stuff. So there's the courtroom scenes that, you know, reflect that experience, but by far the biggest influence I think is this HBOT experience that I had. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something that is real. It's probably something that if you go to any of your hospitals, like that are, you know, your local hospitals, any hospital that's like a big hospital would probably have it. It's used and it's FDA approved for things like carbon monoxide poisoning, for burns, um, for um, deep wounds that won't heal like diabetic wounds and things like that. Um, and it's also an experimental um, type of therapy for other things like everything from Lyme disease and infertility to cerebral palsy and, um, and autism. 
And I came to actually experience it myself with one of my kids. So I have three boys. I'm here in the D.C. area. And all three boys are fine now. But when they were little, when they were like, you know, babies and toddlers, they all suffered from weird medical mystery types of issues that, and they were totally like not even similar to each other's. And so I got to know the children's hospital in DC very well, like all of the different departments. So like one of my kids, for example, was born deaf in one year and it was a neuropathy type of thing. And, um, so then we needed to like worry, did he have other neuropathies? Were his other neurological functions um, problematic? And because of this dyssynchrony in the auditory input that he was getting in two years, he had um, issues with, you know, just uh, speech therapy, needing speech therapy and auditory integration therapy and all sorts of things that sort of put me in contact with the world of children today who have you know, autism and cerebral palsy in the DC area um, who also needed the same types of therapies. So I became very close with that community of moms. And the same kid when he was four years old was then hit with a bunch of other diagnoses that had really nothing to do, we think, with um, the auditory stuff. So he had um, celiac disease and he also had ulcerative colitis. And the ulcerative colitis in particular just like didn't respond to anything that, you know, we had hoped that it would respond to. So here's this little four-year-old who's throwing up every day, who is crying every day after eating and saying that things hurt. And he is, you know, not able to um, actually gain weight. So he's having failure to thrive and all of these things that, you know, just are really, really horrific for, you know, a first time mother, he was my oldest. And so um, one of my friends who had a child with autism, um, who lived like in my area said, hey, um, I was researching this weird thing called HBOT was coming to our neighborhood. It's a group chamber. And I, I was researching it for kids with autism, but I found some research that has to do with kids with ulcerative colitis. So she sent it to me. And so um, I decided to look into it. And we were so desperate by this point because nothing was working and he just wasn't gaining weight. And he was so miserable. And so we went to go see it. And it was like 10 minutes away from my house. And I still remember the first time we saw it, my son, who was four, pointed to it and went, look, it's a submarine. Because it looked like that. It looked like a little mini submarine. We had just watched the Beatles Yellow Submarine for family movie night. Um, it was during the summertime. And, um, and it looked just like a little mini submarine. You crawl in and they, you know, seal you inside. And, you know, it looks like a little mini submarine had four portholes for the four patients or the four beetles. And, um, and you sit inside and then they pressurize you and it's sort of your ears pop the same way that, you know, they pop if you're diving or, or even when you're like going from um, when you're landing in an airplane and the pressure changes. It's that type of a feeling. So the air pressure changes and then they feed pure oxygen into you through by virtue of this like oxygen hood that you're wearing. So then my son was like, oh, look, I'm a diver. You know, like it, it, it sort of looked like that, like a, an astronaut or a diving, you know, type of um, hat. And it's a hood and it sort of like encircles your entire face. And then you're just breathing in normally, but you're breathing in pure oxygen rather than air, which is, I think, like 28% oxygen, I forget, something like that. And so the theory is, is that the oxygen under this deep pressure can really infiltrate into your cells, your blood, your tissue, everything that you need in, and your nerves in order to accelerate healing of damaged cells. Uh, much more quickly. And so that's the theory. And um, we did 40 of these 
um, diving sessions, and each session is like an hour. So we did that for a whole uh, for 40 sessions, which is like basically the whole summer. And um, and I wasn't a writer at that time that we did this, but when I became a writer later, I immediately thought of the setting because it's just this amazing setting it's very intense it's very in, intimate and you just crawl you crawled in and you know if you have any type of phobia as far as like claustrophobia then obviously it's really like high anxiety situation for you and there are four kids in there who are all you know suffering from a variety of different things all different levels of disability. So that leads itself to, you know, a lot of conversations and a lot of sort of um, comparing back and forth about sort of your experience versus the other family's experiences. And it was just such an amazing experience for me. And so I immediately thought of the setting when I started writing a novel and thought, okay, I have to have sort of my worst nightmare which was going through my head the entire time we were doing this, which is that the pure oxygen gives way to some sort of explosion or fire or something like that. And that was something that I like really was afraid of. And I had like done a lot of research on and tried to make sure that, you know, they were doing everything that they could obviously to sort of make sure that that didn't happen. Um, but it's, you know, one of those things that you, you know, as, as a person with a lot of imagination, you just sort of like were upset about. And so that's something that I sort of thought immediately, okay, this has to happen. That's the inciting incident of the novel. Well, it's a great setting. Sorry, I, I went, I went on and on. Sorry about that. No. I get very into this. No, it's a perfect setting because it is such a small enclosure and it's pressure building and you can feel the pressure building in the book. So I think it works perfectly. Um, I was fascinated by it and then it led me to do Thank a whole you. bunch of research on it <laughs> after the fact. Well, um, and, and, oh my God, and I just saw yesterday, I just saw an, um, an article in the NIH medical database that I started. I used to, when I was a lawyer, I used to do um, some medical malpractice um, work defending um, Georgetown Hospital and some of the doctors um, against some of the lawsuits and things. And so I sort of still, you know, tool around in the data databases. And I just saw that there was this HBOT, um, they're now testing HBOT for COVID-19, um, you know, because a lot of it is trying to get air into, you know, your lungs and into your body and making sure that the lung, you know, air uh, oxygen deprivation doesn't occur. And so it was actually talking about the HBOD um, and how they're actually doing some experiments on that. So that was really exciting to see yesterday. Oh, that's fascinating. And now I know what I'm going to be looking to Yeah, um, I know, right? Yeah. One of the other thing, settings I really enjoyed was the courtroom scenes, and you had spoke previously that you um, were a lawyer, and I was going to say we had um, some people I've talked to who've also read the book who practice law or formally practice law, they thought the courtroom scenes felt really real and authentic to them. Um, I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about how you approach writing the courtroom scenes, especially with your background, and why, how did you decide to walk away from being a lawyer, if that's okay. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually is a literary story, which is uh, why I decided not to be a lawyer anymore. Um, but yeah, I was a litigator, and I think I became a litigator because um, I, in, when I was in high school, I was into theater. And so I was, uh, I was a theater person, I was an actor, and um, I really loved the performative aspects of, you know, being a performer, obviously. And I really, and then um, I remember a lot of my um, friends who were also acting majors from my high school, I went to a fine arts high school um, that was boarding school in Michigan called Interlochen. And a lot of them actually did go on to, you know, Juilliard and NYU and Yale and whatever for acting. Um, and I, my, um, and I wasn't that 
great. Um, so it probably was that my acting coaches were being nice to me. But I remember them saying, hey, you're Asian. There really aren't that many roles for Asian actors right now. And maybe it'll change in the future, but maybe it won't. And I think it's going to be really, really hard. And, you know, again, like I wasn't like the most talented actor, but still it really crushed me. And so I did think, okay, I'm really good in academics. I'm pretty smart and I get good grades and whatever. So I could probably do something, you know, related to that. But I did think when I was thinking about careers, sort of thought, okay, I like the sort of performative uh, aspects of being a lawyer. Like if, if you're a litigator, and you're in court, you're having to sort of act in some ways. You're having to do things that um, feign, you know, surprise, even though you obviously know what they're going to, uh, what they're about to say. It's not like you're actually surprised, but you act like it, you know, and, um, and all of these interesting things that happen because you feel like you're on stage in some ways. And so I think I was always drawn to that aspect of being a lawyer, so of being a litigator in particular. And so I did that for a while. And then I actually decided to give it up because there was this one month, and this has to do with literature, so I'll actually tell the whole story. Um, so there was this one month when I had three uh, trials in a row. And it was like, I was just like, basically staying up the entire month. I don't know how, if I got any sleep whatsoever. And I was in my 20s and I, I was, um, my, my then fiance, um, now my, my husband, um, who's also a litigator, um, said, hey, I'm about to go to San Francisco for some work thing. Come out with me. You're done with your trials. You need just some relaxation time. And so I went out to um, San Francisco with him. We're in the D.C. area. And we went to some, and, and he was off doing whatever work he was doing. And so I was by myself. And it was a blustery day. It was a miserable, miserable day, like rain, like wind, storm. Ah. And um, I went out by myself to the ocean area, like, which I just love. I love the Pacific Ocean. I just prefer to the East Coast Atlantic Ocean for whatever reason. And I went to the Cliff House, which is now a beautiful touristy type place back then. This was like 30 years ago. It was like a hole in the wall, but it was right on the beach. And with it being blustering and stuff, just the ocean was amazing. And so I sat and I was the only person in this entire restaurant. And so I sat like at the best table that was like overlooking the ocean the, like right on the cliff and I ordered like a bottle of wine and some cheese and fruit or whatever and I sat there for like seven hours and I read this thin book that someone had given me from and to like from cover to cover and it's the Tim O'Brien's In the Lake of the Woods which remains to this day my favorite book of all time. And it's a mystery about a wife who goes missing at the beginning of the novel. And there are all these hypotheses and evidence chapters and things like that. And there's no ending. You don't know what happened. And you're not meant to know what happened. And it really intrigued me. And I just found myself thinking about it. And I was so happy just reading this novel. And... I just thought to myself at the end of that experience, I have not been this happy in so long, like in years. And so I really need to get myself a new job and a new career because obviously like my life is just not fulfilling if I can't have time for things like this, like reading this novel. And so it was really that experience that led me to say, you know what, I don't think that I want to be a lawyer anymore. And so I told my husband when he came into dinner that night, I'm going to quit tomorrow. And he was like, oh, okay, yeah, fine. Um, so he was very supportive. And, um, and so it was that experience. But what was cool about this novel, about writing this novel, Miracle Creek, was that 
The one thing I loved about being a lawyer was actually being in the courtroom. I loved like everything about it. I loved like cross-examining witnesses, especially. I loved, um, you know, telling the jury the sort of the story via the opening and the closing statements. I loved um, objecting. Like I just loved everything about that experience. I just didn't love anything outside of the courtroom. And so it was really a wonderful way to be able to revisit that experience and sort of feel like I was almost back in the courtroom as I was writing, you know, these scenes, except better because I could actually control what the witnesses were saying and doing and, you know, how they were reacting, which you obviously can't in real life. So it was really amazing from that perspective. And, and thank you for saying the thing about how real it felt, but I will tell you that I edited so much of it out because my editor and even my husband, who's actually a lawyer himself, were like, this is just too boring. You put too much of the actual like real life stuff in there. So you need to edit all that out because there are just like seven objections in two pages and you just can't have that. And I was like, what? That's what a good lawyer would do. And they were like, no, 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 it's cutting like the flow of you know, the argument. So cut that out. So I, I, I cut a lot of it out, but that makes me happy when people say that it seems realistic because to me, I'm just like horrified that I had to cut so much out. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's realistic, but maybe abbreviated in some sense. Definitely. Um, so you sure. talked about how this book has so many personal connections for you with the H bot and then the your, form, your background as a litigator. Um, I was wondering if you could also touch on um, the, you know, um, Mary's family and uh, the immigration experience from South Korea, which is another big portion of the book. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So I am, so I immigrated from Seoul um, to the Baltimore area when I was 11. And the Yu family in the novel, um, who own, who are the owners of this HBOT chamber, Miracle Submarine, they also are Korean immigrants. And um, Mary Yu is a teenager who is the only child of this family. And she is basically me. And so it's really interesting to sort of write a character. In fact, she was probably the hardest character for me to write. And in fact, um, I didn't actually have any chapters from her perspective um, in my, in my uh, as late as like my fifth draft or something like that. And it was really my agent after my, I queried and I got an agent and my agent actually said, you know, before I actually submit it to editors and try to sell this book, I really think that you should add perspectives, uh, chapters, new chapters from two additional characters that you don't have in the first um, iteration that she read. And one of them was Mary, who is the teenage daughter. And I think one of the reasons why I left her out is because I do find as a writer, I don't know about any of you who are listening to this, who are also writers yourselves, but I find that the people who, whom you're closest to, um, you know, who have as like more of you than the other characters are actually harder to write for me. And, um, and I think it's just because it's harder to make them authentic without making them real. So you're sort of like focusing on how do I make this character a fictional character who's different from me. And it's really it, the closeness actually, actually, I think makes it a little bit harder to sort of um, get that authenticity, but also put them into this fictional world, which you know, you know, is not what you experienced yourself. And so I thought that was really interesting to do that. Um, but in any case, yeah, she and the family are definitely based on my family's experience um, in the novel. The family, um, the Yu family is actually a, something called a, um, a Kirogi Appa, which is a goose, wild goose father family. 
um, from Korea, which is a sort of because, like a fashionable thing in Korea, like in the last 15 years or so, it wasn't something that I experienced myself, but I read about it and how it's becoming so popular. And it's this kind of family where um, it's called the wild goose father because the father stays in Korea to make money and support the family while the mom and the kids go off to, you know, the U.S., Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, English-speaking countries to actually get an education. So the family is completely separated um, so that the kids can actually get what they consider to be a better education. And so this is something that's actually common now, um, relatively common. There are, I think, like two to three million uh, wild goose fathers. And they call them goose fathers because the, the dad migrates, migrates, quote unquote, the family migrates once a year to see each other. Um, so that's where the goose father, you know, uh, name came from. Um, so I didn't have that in my own background, but other than that, it's pretty much my family's uh, story that I've basically told here in Miracle Creek. So, yeah. I was wondering, since this book incorporates so much of your life, how did your family respond to the book? Oh, such, a, such an awesome, awesome question. Okay, so um, I am an only child, so it's, you know, my, my mom and my dad, and um, they have been so supportive, but I, you know, I didn't really show them the book. I think for the longest time, I thought this was not going to be a real book. And in fact, I found this file. Um, I'm working on my second novel now. And so I'm having all these, all this anxiety. And so I was looking through all of my um, first novels files and sort of archiving them. And one of the files that I found is this file like that I wrote really, really early on that sort of said in all caps, this is not a novel. And that was the name of the file. And this is not a novel, again, in all caps. And it was basically talking about the fact that, like, look, most people whose experiences I've heard about who are, you know, like, with respect to their debut novel, is that they write a novel, and then they decide that it's terrible and with their practice novel, and then they put it away in a drawer, and they never look at it again. And that was sort of their practice. And so you should feel free when you're writing your first novel to do whatever you want, because it's not it's most likely not going to be a novel. And so that's what I told myself with respect to Miracle Creek. So I never showed my parents the novel or told them what I was writing or what it was about or anything like that, because I thought, okay, I'm going to write this. It's a practice novel. Um, it now has seven POV characters, um, point of view characters. But even back then, um, even before my um, agent got a hold of it and suggested that I add the two POVs, it still was five POVs, which I sort of considered it way too many. And I, so I sort of thought there's no way that this is going to see the light of day. This is my practice novel. And so I never really showed it to them. And then finally, lo and behold, like all this stuff happened, I got an agent and we sold it and all this kind of stuff and it was coming out. So my parents finally saw it when it was in book form as an advanced uh, reader copy in, you know, and it looks sort of like a paperback book. And when they did, I remember my mom said, I gave them just one copy. My, my mom said that my dad read it like twice in one week, the same week that I gave it to them. So I thought, okay, he didn't say anything to me about it. He doesn't, he's very much like not a talker, sort of like Pac, which is one of the father Korean immigrant figure in the novel. And so I, but I figured if he read it twice in one week, that's probably a good sign. My mom, on the other hand, did not say anything about it for like months. And so I was thinking, that's really bizarre because my mom is like a fast reader. She loves books. And so I thought this meant she was trying to let me down easily. Like she didn't like it, but she didn't want to tell me about it. So I just thought, okay, I just won't bring it up. And then one day, like maybe three or four months after she got it, I, after I gave it to her, 
um, she called me one day and she was crying and she said that she loved the novel and she finished it. And she explained that it was really hard for her to read because she felt she apologized to me because so much of the Korean family's experience in there was our, was, you know, like it, what it, it's fiction. And I kept on telling her that, like I kept on saying, look, mom, it's fiction. But she could see that the kernel of the experience was ours. And so she apologized. And I think she felt badly that obviously, you know, there had been some painful experiences that I had gone through as, you know, a teenager and things like that. So, um, so, but she's, and then she's um, recently there in Florida for the quarantine and, um, and they've been there, there for a good, I don't know, like eight months or something now. And she just told me that she and my dad were taking turns rereading it to each other um, out loud. So I just, I thought that was really wonderful. And I love that. Yeah. That's so awesome. Um, yeah. So a few more questions about the book before we get into how you became sure. an author and what your writing process looks like. I was curious about the title of the book. Was there another title originally? Um, how did you come up with just the title? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, you must know the history for you to ask. Maybe you don't. But um, so the original title, well, there were two original titles. So my working title was Bon Bonds in a Blue Submarine. And that's in reference to one of the characters in the pivotal scene says to another character, two moms who are special needs moms say to each other, you know, your kid is like totally normal. If I don't know why you're doing all of this, meaning all the therapies that she's doing. If I were you, I would lie on the couch and eat bonbons all day. And so somebody actually did say that to me for real when I was doing my H5. Um, and she didn't mean to be mean about it. She just meant, you know, she was, she just, she was just telling me that she thought that my kid seemed fine because he was like, he behaviorally, he was fine. You know, it's just that he was growing up after eating every day, <laughs> which she didn't get to see. But in any case, so, um, so that was sort of my working title for a long time because it was really that emotion, sort of the comparison between um, the different disabilities, the hierarchy of the different, different disabilities, and also sort of this idea of the relativity of happiness that really drove why I wanted to write about this, um, this experience. And, um, and I think that's one of the big themes of the novel, um, even though I wasn't completely sure, you know, what, what the theme was um, when I was writing it. But looking back on it, I think that was, was one of the big uh, drivers of that. Um, and then um, it very soon changed the title, changed to Miracle Submarine. Because Miracle Submarine is almost like a character in the novel. It's sort of the it's like a crucible. It is the place where you are sealed in and physically it's a crucible because you can't escape it. And emotionally it's a crucible because inside this, this tube that you're locked, it's sealed inside of with other families, you are sort of like all these emotions are bubbling up and all these comparisons and all the compare and contrast of the various children and things like that. So Miracle Submarine to me became sort of the character, the focal point of the novel. And so that was the um, title. And I was actually talking about this with a bunch of writers earlier today. Um, and one really, really influential bookseller objected to it and said, I hate this title. This is the worst title I've ever heard in my life. Miracle Submarine. I think she hated it. One of the reasons why she hated it was because it um, made her think of like sci-fi maybe, and also maybe a little bit like military thriller. And so it didn't, to her, it didn't really reveal what the book was really about. And she was worried that it was going to confuse 
readers, like who might think, oh, maybe this is a sci-fi thriller or a military thriller instead of what it really is, which actually nobody really knows what it is anyway. So because it's blends so many different genres together. So there's really no one genre that it belongs to. So in any case, um, but so we ended up changing it from Miracle Submarine to Miracle Creek, which is the name of the town where this all takes place, where Miracle Submarine, the um, business uh, and the HBOT therapy center is. And I actually love that because um, Dennis Lehane's Mystic River is with a huge influence for me in writing this novel. And so far as the voice is concerned, the plot, I actually like deconstructed and analyzed that book. Um, and like did a scene by scene breakdown of that book and, and as far as the POVs were concerned, all sorts of things to try to figure out how to make a successful and compelling sort of literary thriller and uh, or murder mystery. And so to me, I made um, the name of the town Miracle Creek as an homage to Mystic River, Mystic River, Miracle Creek. And so in one sense, I thought that naming it, that having the title of the novel be Miracle Creek was as, as sort of like a cool titular homage, so. Awesome. So I was hoping we could ask you a few questions about um, the writing process for you. Um, yeah, for yeah. sure authors in the chat I see a few questions um, yeah. uh, so first off when it comes to writing are you more um, of a plotter or a pantser do you have to do you know who your killer is going to be before you get started or did you figure it out along the way yeah no I love that um, love that question um, so I am not a plotter although I aspire to be I would like to be a plotter, um, but unfortunately, I just like am not. Um, so for Miracle Creek, I tried my hardest to figure out before I started writing who had set the fire, and I could not do it, or like how. And I just, I was just like, okay, I need to start writing at some point because I'm just like spinning my wheels. And so I just started writing. And I did know that by the end of the novel, I would have someone, whoever it was, or a group or whatever, um, figure out, like, I, I, we would know the answer. But that was really the only thing that I knew. And so I didn't know for a good year. So I did maybe like six months of pre-writing, like just imagining the world of the novel and doing free writing and stuff like that. And then like another year of the actual writing, like, you know, the first draft. And so it was like a year and a half before I figured out who actually set the fire. And so I guess, that I think that makes me a pantser, mm -hmm. um, but I really like to aspire to be a plotter, and I'm really trying my hardest to plot out my next novel right now, and I'm just having the hardest time. So I, I may give up, and I may just start writing, even though I have no idea what's going to happen by the end, um, but I would really love to know what's going to happen by the end of the novel before I start writing this next one. Sounds good. Um, so I was wondering what the writing process or setup looks for you. Like, do you have set times you go? Like, do you have to be in a certain space when you write? Do you need silence or could you work in a busy cafe? No, so I, I really can't work. I need silence. That is the one thing that I need. Um, and so if I'm in a cafe and I need to write, then I will um, put on some white noise that I have pre like um, um, loaded onto my iTunes or um, I'll do like a YouTube, you know, um, beach sounds or something like that. That's um, so I like doing that because I can't write with music. I can't write with um, I just need like quiet or white noise. And so that's sort of what I need. And as far as the space. I was actually talking about this earlier today too. So 
I'm right next to my writing space and my writing space is here. I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit. Um, I don't know if you can see, can you guys see that? It's like a closet. Yeah. It's like a little tiny nook and it's like a Harry Potter type of closet cupboard. Like that's like maybe half the size of Harry Potter's cupboard in the movie. And, um, and there, in fact, the ceiling is sloped and so low that you can't even like put a desk in there. Like I couldn't even sit in a chair. So I'm on the floor and which is how, I, how I'm sitting right now. And I'm sitting on the floor, just cross-legged, um, like yoga style. And that's how I write in this tiny little uh, luggage. I think it's supposed to be a luggage closet. So that's, and there's no like, there's no decorations there's no windows there's nothing there's no wi-fi access because it's the farthest from my wi-fi um thing yeah so i, I i'm I, i'm having to give myself a hot spot from my phone to do this because <laughs> i'm right outside it um right. yeah oh and the other place where i like to write is in my car so i did a lot of you know basically like um driving my kids around northern virginia and so i would drive them drop them off for like you know some golf match or some basketball game practice or whatever and then i would just sit in the parking lot and i would just write in my car for so my car and this little closet are the two places where i wrote that's good so i have some questions from people uh, on the audience this evening, so I was hoping we could go yeah. through a few. Um, so this sure. is from Denise. She asked if it's not too personal, uh, since Mary is built on your teenage years, was your relationship to your mom similar to Mary's? Um, you know, I think so. Yeah, I absolutely. I think, I think it's one of these things, um, Unfortunately, yeah, I, I think we were so close in Korea, just like Mary and Young were, that I think that when we came here and my mom was no longer sort of always with me and she was actually working and she was in this um, grocery store, just like Young was, you know, um, and I couldn't go visit her because it was so dangerous. My dad was actually shot a what um and the bullet grazed his neck and so that's how uh, that's how dangerous it was and so a lot of those scenes about the alienation that mary felt from young are definitely taken from my own experiences and yeah and i think that i would like to be able to say that sure me being an intelligent person understood what my mom was doing and all that kind of stuff but unfortunately I was, you know, a bratty preteen. And so therefore, I think I definitely resented the fact that we lost that close relationship that we had in Korea. And, um, and so yeah, I, I, I think there was a lot of resentment there. And I think that's one of the reasons why my mom felt, found it so difficult to read this book when she first did and why there was a lot of tears and things like that when she first did. And why I think ultimately it was really good that she was able to read it and we were able to talk about it once the book came out because I'm not sure that we really got resolution on that until now. So yeah, I think it was. Um, Corinne. Also oh, and I saw that. And by the way, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I, it's totally my fault that my, I saw the comment about the author's picture being so blurry. I'm so sorry. It's totally me. I have really crappy Wi-Fi in my house and uh, it's just, it's horrible. And so I'm having to use the hotspot. So my hotspot isn't that much better. So I apologize with me. <laughs> no problem. Um, we have someone, uh, Corinne wrote in, she's also a lawyer living in Northern Virginia and she loved Miracle Creek. She wanted to know who, um, who some, like, what are some of your favorite authors? Oh, okay. Um, so I already talked about Tim O'Brien and, uh, in the Lake of the Woods. And I also talked about, uh, Dennis Lehane 
and Mystic River. Um, I love um, Jennifer Egan and uh, especially Visit from the Goon Squad. And I'm so excited for her Visit from the Goon Squad sequel or companion, as she called it, that's coming out this fall. And I love that one because I feel like um, she sort of nails the all the different voices. I, I, to me, that's one of the the greatest things about um, multiple POV novels is when you have different characters who take over different scenes and they have really different voices. And it really drives me at the wall when you know, it's supposed to be like different characters talking and they all sort of sound like they were written by the same person. I don't like that at all. So, so I love the fact that she has these different voices and she uses like different formats, like some are in second persons. One is, you know, first person, but it's written in PowerPoint form, you know, like so many different ways. And she just, I, I just love her. Um, from that and really admire her from that perspective. Um, I also love um, um, Kate, um, oh God, what's her name? Ah, life after, Kate Atkinson, Life After Life. Um, I love the fact that she tackles like sci-fi in one and then a traditional detective novel in the next and then like a, you know, a more just generic, like general, uh, literary in the next. And I feel like people, authors who can sort of experiment like that and sort of embrace different genres and sort of meld different genres together are just have my highest respect. So I love her. Yeah. Um, we have another question in the chat from Polly. She wanted to know if you're able to tell us anything about your next novel. Oh, yes, I can. Okay, so I'll talk about it since I can't really write about it. I mean, I can write about it. I'm just having a hard time right now. Um, but it's called Happiness Quotient. And it's about a family, a biracial family in the Northern Virginia area, circa now, like right around now. I'm not sure whether it's like post or pre pandemic. Um, so that's one of the things that I am struggling with right now. Um, but it's about a teenager who is a teenage boy who is nonverbal with apraxia, which is sort of akin to autism and sort of uh, comorbid with autism. And, um, and he goes on a walk at the beginning of the novel with his father, who's the primary caregiver, who's the stay-at-home dad. And um, only the boy returns home. And because he's nonverbal, he can't tell the authorities or the family what happened on the walk. And so the family sort of needs to come together to try to figure out what happened. Um, and, um, and in order to figure that out, they need to communicate in some way with the boy. Um, and, you know, and his uh, older brother and sister who are fraternal twins really um, become obsessed with using uh, assistive communication therapies and technologies to try to figure out what happened and to communicate with him. Sounds great. Um, so I have two more questions unless anyone else has anything else coming into the chat. Um, one, this is one I would like to know since Miracle Creek is your debut novel. Um, it, what did you learn most about the whole um, mm. process that you would do differently in the future? Or would you change anything? Um, I'm not sure that I would change anything in the future just because about the publication process or even the writing process. I really feel like the writing process, it was long and inefficient, but unfortunately, that's just the way it is, I think, when you're learning a new craft um, the way that I am. And I think that even with this next novel, I was like hoping that it would be more efficient by virtue of like me, you know, learning to uh, outline, you know, first, like I was saying that I was trying to do. And unfortunately, I just, 
I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm becoming resigned to the fact that I'm just not that kind of a writer, unfortunately, which I would love to be, but, but sadly, I don't think I am. Um, so I'm not sure that there's anything I would change about the writing. And as far as the publication process, I don't think there's anything with that either, because I've just loved, um, I love my agent so much, and I love my editor, I love my publisher. So I, I, I can't say that there's anything I would change. Um, I wish that I could have done the whole thing without so much angst about being a debut novelist and um, not be as concerned about like, you know, oh, what are the reviews on Goodreads and what are, what is my Amazon ranking and how many copies that I sell? Like, I wish I could get away from that, but I think that that's, I, I, having a lot of debut author friends, I think that's just something that we all go through. So unfortunately, I think that's just the way it is. But I, I mean, one thing that I've learned a lot, and I think the most important thing is just patience. And I think the thing that I did right more than anything else is being patient and, you know, you, uh, going through the uh, revising process and editing process with my um my writing group that I have. And I, I think that, you know, even if it takes, if it takes another year of edits before you're happy with it, it doesn't, a year doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter whether you take another year or not, you know, um, and that's the same for short stories as it is for novels. And the same thing with um, agents. Um, I I just I think that I did my agent search in a very systematic way and I got very lucky because in my first batch of 10 sort of agent queries that I sent out I found my agent but even if I hadn't I really think that getting the best agent you can meaning best meaning like the best fit that you can but also the most sort of like reputable and the most prestigious that you can I think helps so much in how much credibility you have with editors that I think it's worthwhile to just go through the process. Um, and even if it takes an extra year or two or three or four even, just to get the best agent you possibly can. I just, I really, I've, come to believe in the power of agents that much. I think it's that important that I think it's more important to like just sort of like query, even if it's blind to lots and lots of agents who you think are just sort of the big names in the industry rather than just go with a first agent that you happen to meet at, you know, whatever uh, event that you go to. That's great advice for aspiring authors. <laughs> to take their time and patience and find the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, it's the same when you're um, querying uh, like literary magazines for short stories. You know, you, uh, you know, I sort of did it in a systematic way where you would just be like, okay, so the first round is like New Yorker and the Atlantic and the Harper's and you know, the people that aren't going to really give you the time of day probably, but you never know. So you just query them. And then six months later, you query, you know, Tin House and Plowshares and, you know, American Short Fiction and all of those. And then, uh, and one story and, you know, and then when you get the nose from all of them, then you move on to the next one and the next one. And, and it might take three years that way, but that way you're sure that you got sort of the best that you could. And I think it's worthwhile because at the end of the day, who cares if you published in 2012 or 2015? It doesn't matter. So anyway, that's just me. Um, sounds good. So I think we're about out of time for this evening. Um, oh, you yeah. <laughs> Do you have any final um, advice you'd give for any writers or just anything, another tidbit of what you've learned throughout this whole process? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll just go through the quick, the open questions really, really quickly, um, if that's okay. Um, so the advice that I would give to someone who hopes to become an author one day, I think, you know, that would be like, take your time, but also like to actually work on some short stories or short, mem you know, short essays, if you're a memoirist, and, um, and really try to submit them and get them published into the literary journals, even if they're like obscure ones that nobody's heard of, because just by just the act of like submitting and being edited by and then being published in um, even the sort of the, the journals that nobody's heard of is really, really valuable, I think, not only from a craft perspective, but also from the perspective of being able to put that in the agent queries that you're going to write. So that's that's my number one always go to advice for um, for you know people who want to write book length works. And uh, inspiration behind the character of Elizabeth is probably me, um, in that I'm sort of a type A mom, and I've felt like all of these you know angsty things about being a mom to a kid who isn't quite as bad off as some of the other kids in the age bot. And um, I've tried to put a lot of my maternal guilt and things like that into her character. Um, camel cigarettes for all of the characters. Um, I just like camel cigarettes. I sort of liked them when I was a teenager and I was experimenting with smoking, which I like never really became a smoker, but still did a little bit of smoking uh, in high school. And uh, and then when I was writing the first scene with cigarettes, my husband is a um, uh, guitarist. A, he's a um, musician, lead guitarist in a cover band in Northern Virginia. And he was smoking, uh, he was uh, playing rather in a bar that had a smoking area. This was like, you know, when I was first working on a book like in 2012 or 13 or something. And they had this smoke, like the cigarette vending machine. And it was, it had a big camel brand, like, so it had a huge camel logo in the very big, in the front. And so I took a picture of it and I was like, oh, I think that's the universe telling me that I should use camels and I'm very superstitious. So I did that. And then, um, and then finally, um, the uh, lawyers, the chamber helping my son, I, you know, by the end of the summer, he did outgrow the ulcerative colitis. So I'm careful to say that it's not just the HBOT because we were doing so many other things at the same time, but I certainly don't think that it hurt. And I think that so many lawyers become authors because lawyers hate being lawyers because they're rational people and being a lawyer sucks. <laughs> and so I think lawyers can become many other things, one of which is writing. So, and also I think that, you know, being a lawyer does involve telling stories and it does involve a lot of writing and words. And so I do think that that leads to it too. But anyway, all right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so and much. Sorry, I had to be so, wor so hurried in all of my answers at the end. No, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you, Angie. Um, if you haven't checked out her book, uh, you can check it out from the library or the Learned Owl is selling copies that you have graciously signed for anyone. Um, the yes. link bio. Um, thank you guys, everyone, for attending this evening. Have a great night. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.